All right. So once again, thank you all for continuing to participate in track three, GIS and resilience. Um, if you are in the wrong track, you know, feel free to go back to the uh, All Hazards Consortium site, which the link is in the chat to go to a different track. There's the link right there. All right, so our next speaker is Chris Vaughn. He is the Geospatial Information Officer at FEMA, and he's going to be talking about how GIS and data is helping FEMA with decision making. So Chris, it is all you. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, just doing a mic check, can you hear me okay? Yep, loud and clear, Chris. Oh, great, thanks. Now, let's see, you know, you- Welcome. You know, has, has, <laughs> hey, thanks, thanks, Tom. Great to be with you. So yeah, so uh, here we go, screen share. You know, you, you know, hashtag 2020 to go into 21. Where is the screen share button? That's the, you know, so I finally found it here. Thanks. It, we, we usually use a different competitor version. So it's all about buttonology, right? <laughs> so uh, first of all, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to be a part of the conversation. Um, Tom, I am absolutely jealous of your, um, your video there. Uh, I, I really, honestly, I think I can put my career in, into to that, that video. Uh, I think I, I have dedicated most of my professional work and efforts towards damage assessment. So it's really exciting to see where you guys are headed with SICE and SICENET. Um, it's something that the emergency management community writ large really struggles with. Um, I'm gonna speak a lot about it. In fact, while I was watching your video, I'll, tell, I'll tattle on myself. I, I realized I needed to put a slide in there uh, to speak about damage assessment. So I'll call myself out when we get to that slide. But uh, without further ado, let me, let me tell you a little bit about who I am and, and, uh, and how I got here. So uh, I'm the Geospatial Information Officer for FEMA. I've been at FEMA for 10 years. Uh, prior to that, I uh, supported um, a number of disaster-related initi initiatives in the private sector as well as in the intelligence community, um, but I'm addicted to this mission, hands down. I, I love uh, trying to use technology to better affect the outcome, how to use technology to better support decisions. And so, um, you know, that's really where I found a, a good uh, symbiotic um, relationship with Tom and, and All Hazards Consortium. So, you know, we've, we've kept in contact and close proximity to each other for, um, for sure, at least since Hurricane Sandy. I think maybe that's where my earliest recollections of AHC came into play. Uh, but it's amazing to just kind of sit back and watch where the community is headed, both, both on the technology side, but really what this community in particular, AHC is doing, you know, bringing in private sector data and then merging it with, with all the rest of the stuff that's out there. So it's, it's really excited to be here with you today and hopefully you'll get something out of this presentation. Got about 20 slides. I think I've got about 45 minutes to get on it. Um, but we'll, we'll punch through these real quick, but I'd love to, I'd love to get through the slides and, and, and really open it up for some discourse or discussion at the end. So, uh, you know, uh, if you want to throw some ideas in the chat, maybe that'll, that'll garner some of the discussion at the end, but uh, without further ado, let me just get right into it. So 2020, um, you know, without question was a, you know, not, not only, and you see that right there at the bottom, not only was 2020 the year of you know, COVID and, and the pandemic, but it was a significant year in an, in its own right in, with relation to a significant no notice or notice incidents. Um, and really, honestly, it started off, the year started off with January 7th. There was a, a, a devastating earthquake in the Southwest of Puerto Rico. Uh, it's hard for me to wrap my mind around that. That was only a year ago. It feels like five years ago, but uh, there was significant damage that occurred. Uh, we honestly, we, we threw the kitchen sink at that earthquake. We already had a large presence on the island. We collected a lot of imagery. We collected UAS imagery with LIDAR. We collected 3D imagery. We collected all kinds of satellite imagery. We collected thousands of ground photos, all in an effort to speed up those damage assessments uh, that, that we just saw a great video on. Coming out of January and into the early spring, we had a rash of tornadoes starting in February with a large tornado in the Nashville area. And then that was followed uh, with a number of tornadoes uh, in um, the Chattanooga, 
area and then down in uh, Mississippi and Alabama and Texas. It just kind of bounced all over the place. So we had a really active tornado season and then a really, really active uh, wildfire season. And then it was the most active Atlantic hurricane season. So everything was a record, 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 record. And all the while, you know, the middle of March, all the way through present day, we're dealing with a worldwide global pandemic. I mean, just what a year. Um, and and um, I'm sure, you know, and we've, we've come through a lot, but we've got a lot more to go. So, you know, my hat's off to everybody that is currently supporting and has supported any number of one of these things. So um, FEMA, if you can see there at the bottom, we had 300, more than 300 de disaster declarations pushed out last year. And this is just 10 out of the 300 of, of the things that we, that we responded to. Well, as I said in my opening statement, you know, the, our goal, our team's goal is to provide real time and, and really operational intelligence to our senior level decision maker. My boss likes to use the term reducing uncertainty in the decision making process. Um, so since my boss pays my paycheck, I like to use words that he uses. Uh, and so um, uh, when he says reducing uncertainty, what he really means is so much of emergency management is experiential. You have to experience it. In fact, one of our statements that we use here a lot is you don't know unless you go. A lot of female people say that. You need to know, you need to go in order to know. So um, what they mean by that is, is we frame our response sometimes based on previous incidents. You know, a tornado today may remind somebody, myself personally, of things like the Joplin tornado or more Oklahoma. And so when you get into that initial response, you, you default back to muscle memory and you start responding the way, well, it worked in more, it must work in Kansas or Florida, or pick, pick somewhere else. That's not always the case, right? Um, every disaster is unique and every disaster is the same. I mean, it's, it's the biggest paradox uh, that's out there. And so, you know, the only real way to get through experiential decision-making is through data and technology. And so that's, I know that's, that's where this community's passion lies. So um, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here. So um, I'm sure you're familiar with the, the FEMA community lifelines. If you're not, I would encourage you to go check that out on FEMA.gov. Uh, we really um, took a step back after the Harvey, Irma, and Maria uh, season, the 2017 season. It, too, was, was a significant year um, of multiple, multiple level one activations back to back to back to back. And uh, they, took a, they took a step back and they reevaluated a number of things. They didn't, they didn't throw away things like PPD-8 or the core capabilities or the ESF structures. They're all still there, but they did introduce these concepts called community lifelines. And, and those are arguably um, really related to things like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, water, food, shelter, power, communication, transportation, safety and security, health and medical. So, I mean, it's really, what is it that, that you know, you need to be able to sustain, um, you know, the elements of life uh, in order, you know, within the first 72 hours, once again, the classic time frame of, of response, 72 hours. So what do we do inside of those parameters, you know, within 72 hours or within the first 96, 120 hours of an incident? Well, we really do three things. We deploy people, we send USAR teams, we send IMATs, we support our IMTs, you know, states and locals. There's EMAC relationships that are being built. Private sector is deploying resources to an incident area. The, R, the, R, the opposite side of that is how many resources are needed, right? Uh, how many people are needed? Um, the second thing we do is we send commodities, right? We send tarps and water bottles and MREs and kits of you know, uh, baby and toddler infant kits. Um, the third thing is we send uh, money. Uh, in the terms of grants, uh, you know, in my, my way, we, you know, the president awards a disaster declaration and that gets the Stafford Act ball rolling. And so uh, there will be housing uh, money or uh, money for public assistance. And so each one of these are complex in their own right, but there is data, science and technology that can support um, all three of these uh, decision processes. 
of course, there's a large part of defining risk. Um, it's really exciting. FEMA just launched something called the National Risk Index, where they've looked at 18 scenarios. They've done an entire um, uh, national coverage of this and, and identified where you know, the highest levels of risk are. You guys ever had 2021, Tom? Help me out here. You ever had 2021? That's my silly dog. Has it barked all day? And she is losing her mind. Ha, ha, you know, have mercy on me, right? So how, how amazing this is. So let me try to get through this without breaking my thought anymore, but I'm clearly struggling with a stupid yappy dog right now. So hallelujah. I can't wait to get back into the office. Um, so we've got the National Risk Index that we just launched, and, and it's out there. It's, it's available. I'd encourage you guys to check that out. Um, but we need to understand and articulate what that risk is. We, we ask our states and local partners to do that through things like uh, Thyra's threat hazard identification risk assessment or our state preparedness reports. What is the capacity of a state uh, responding to an incident? Can they meet a threshold? And what is their determination of being able to respond to something like an atmospheric river uh, in, in, uh, in California that's currently unfolding? One of the other things that we're working on right now is foundational data. So we're really excited about this. This is something coming out of the Oak Ridge National Lab team. It's called USA Structures. Um, it is something that we've been working on for a number of years, probably the better part of four to five years, where we're using satellite imagery to actually extract building outlines for every building in the United States. And with that, we're also trying to apply attribution. So that building is not just a building, it's, it's one of 10 types of buildings, whether it's government, commercial, industrial, uh, residential, educational, you know, you can break that down even further to say universities or colleges, fire stations, police stations. All of that information is valuable and, and intrinsic, intrinsically linked to the community lifelines. So if you start talking about it from a risk perspective, you're identifying risk at the building level, right? And obviously these types of um, data sets are custom made and perfect for things. We're hopeful that it's gonna be perfect for things like hazards, meaning you'll be able to use real time hazard modeling to help inform risk. But more importantly, as the incident is unfolding, you're conducting real time uh, hazard modeling to, to inform response to decisions. So uh, with better data equals better outcomes, better outcomes equals better decisions. So that's really some of our, our guiding principles here. Um, so we're real, real excited about this. We hope to uh, get this out and released publicly uh, by the end of this summer. It's going to be a big deal, uh, hopefully. And, and I'm actually going to speak to this in just a little bit. Um, before I jump off this slide, it's not just the attribution. We're also adding, and this is a keystone statement, we're adding something called a universal unique identifier to each building. That's going to be key in just a few slides. So let me, let me get to that in just a bit. Um, we're, we're also developing a number of real-time hazard model, modeling kinds of things as it relates to the community lifelines. One example of that is our POST product, the Prioritizing Operational Support. POST, uh, first of all, is pub published out on GitHub. Uh, we're, we're trying to get it out there in an open and transparent manner because we need contrarian views of our framework. We need people to chew on this and give us their thoughts about how uh, we can use better uh, data and hazard modeling and frameworks uh, to address a very complex issue, and that is cascading effects or cascading impacts from seven different lifelines. What is the interdependency of transportation as it relates to hospitals? Well, if you can't use transportation to get to the hospital, the hospital may be fine, but the nodes getting to the hospital may impact your ability to, to use the hospital, rendering it uh, less effective uh, than if you had open networks to get people there. You see that in, you know, you know, one of the video points was for Maria. Um, you know, in Maria, it wasn't about generating power. It was about distributing the power. All the power lines were down. We could generate power all day long, but we couldn't get it out to the residences that needed the power. And so you need to understand those interdependencies and, and what needs to be done to try to uh, get those community lifelines back up to um, stability. Okay, so things like that. All right, so here we go. We're going into estimation of, of impact. So we're doing a lot of hazard modeling to estimate 
impacts. Now we're going to switch a little bit gears and talk about remote sensing. Remote sensing is all about using imagery from multiple sensors or platforms. It could come from a satellite. It could come from a, uh, a handheld photo. It could come from a plane. It could come from a news helicopter. We don't care. Just give us a photo and we'll be able to convey that or turn that into actual knowledge. So the traditional process, you see it right here pretty plainly and cleanly, is you've got a FEMA uh, colleague, one of my FEMA colleagues out. He's using a pencil and paper. That's how we do it. Uh, a lot of what we do is pencil and paper. Behind him is another one of our colleagues from SBA. And somebody to the his right or left is, is probably a state or a local entity all you know, working on that pencil paper. Um, looks like one guy's got an actual pen, so he better be right on his tally. Um, so, you know, so um, we know there's a better way. We know there's a faster way to articulate damages. And, um, you know, I'm excited to uh, once again talk to you about this because I know that's a lot of what SiceNet is all about, damage assessments. Um, FEMA uses for the, for the IA preliminary damage assessment workflow, it, it's based on a four category system, major, minor, affected, and destroyed. And there's, there's plenty of documentation out there related to what each one of these mean. But for the sake of the argument and, and for, for clarity of today's purpose, a very general definition is, is presented here, right? Total loss of the home, destroyed, right? All the way up to, you know, minor, you know, there's been some level of damage, but generally, generally it's it's habitable. You can get back in uh, with with uh, with some level of damage, but you can actually reside back in it. Uh, repairable, uh, non-structural damage. Um, once again, this this portion is all about imagery. So there are there's a plethora of imagery sources that are collected immediately following the disaster, and they come from a variety of sources: USGS, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Uh, NOAA has a really robust uh, uh, satellite team called NESDIS. They also have a really robust aerial uh, team, um, and they routinely fly uh, following a disaster. In fact, I'm, I'm convinced that this, this picture you're seeing here is from one of their planes from NOAA. So they're really good at what they do. There's also an explosion of ground imagery that is starting to creep into all of this, right? So Ground imagery, you can think about it as a car riding up and down the street with a camera on top of the hood uh, or on top of the, uh, you know, top of the car taking 360 uh, imagery. Um, all of it stitched together gives you a little bit of a different perspective. Uh, each uh, type of image brings its own unique benefits and challenges. And, and, you know, there's plenty of people trying to crack the codes on these things to automate damage assessments. And so one of those things that is really exploding, it's, it's amazing technology to be at the forefront of all of this, is the use of artificial intelligence. And yes, that is a buzzword. Artificial intelligence has been around easily since you know, the 50s uh, or for sure to the 60s. Um, but generally when we're talking about artificial intelligence in relation to damage assessments, you're really talking about things like um, neural nets or convolutional neural nets or deep learning or uh, computer vision. All of these, once again, are also buzzwords. It's just different ways of using technology and the software to do a very specific function, right? A change detection, you know, something was there and now it's not. Or something looked good on day one and day two, it, it you know, it looked tore up. So, um, there's a lot, there's more progress has been made, honestly, in the last year alone that I've seen in my entire career for emergency response damage assessments. I think that that has to do with a number of things, principally uh, the advent of cloud computing. Uh, you know, there's, you know, it's just ubiqu ubiquitous now. I mean, uh, at FEMA, myself, my team personally, we've been in the cloud environment since probably around 2012, give or take. Um, but it is now a ubiquitous statement that people are in the cloud, you know, worlds. Uh, and there are many, many different clouds out there. All have benefits, some have challenges, all have challenges. Okay. So, um, but you're marrying up the cloud technology with more open algorithms. And so there's plenty of researchers that are out there writing their PhDs on these things. Uh, there's been a number of challenge grants that have been issued from the US government a very successful challenge grant uh, that was sponsored by uh, the Department of Defense is something called XU2. 
And so they gave out free satellite imagery, they gave out the algorithms, they, they put out this challenge. What the government really benefited from, I think it was over maybe 2,000 or 2,500 submissions of code to try to, um, to automate damage assessments faster. Point being is we're all over this. We are um, doing everything we can to communicate with the remote sensing community, with researchers and academics to speed the ability of available imagery with cloud computing and the right algorithms to derive damage assessments faster. Hopefully you guys are all pausing and saying, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I can't wait to see this. Well, we are too, right? So um, I'll be the first to admit, we, we got, I personally got a little overly addicted in the, as, as, you, as we opened it up, there was a lot of incidents last, uh, last year. In the early part of the year was uh, a number of tornadoes. The AI that we did for the tornadoes was amazing. I mean, it was really, it was within 24 hours after the tornado was over, got the plane up, got the plane down, did all this in the cloud. Within 24 hours, we had house by house damage assessments, major minor affected, destroyed, and they were very accurate. It was amazing. Well, I got a little too overzealous. And so when we got into the hurricane season, challenges abounded, right? So we got into the hurricanes at the Laura and the Delta and the Sallies and the ECS. And, you know, I mean, once again, most active Atlantic hurricane season on record. And we tried and we tried and we tried and we tried. And then the wildfires in uh, Washington state and into California, we tried and we tried and boy, did we learn a lot of what not to do, right? So the whole Thomas Edison, I learned a thousand different ways of how not to do AI. So we're, we're working with our remote sensing partners, academics on, 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 on what not to do in the hopes that we advance the whole community and we'll be better for it in the next upcoming hurricane season. So we're excited about what the future holds, recognizing that there are still some speed bumps in the process. This is the slide that I hurried up and, and slid in under cover of darkness and I'm calling myself out, you know, because I saw Tom's amazing uh, video that I'm just still jealous of. Um, this really kind of is tying my entire story together, what we just talked about, right? So you're using disaster models, you're using crowdsourcing capabilities. FEMA's got a very robust crowdsourcing um, outreach engagement program uh, with, with upwards of, you know, seven to 10,000 people contribute their time and effort and energy and brains uh, to help us with complex problems. Uh, you know, we collect a lot of imagery, ground, aerial, and satellite. We're, we're leveraging you know, crisis management systems like SiteNet or uh, WebUC or similar types of, you know, knowledge management solutions. And then of course, this, this near ubiquitous explosion of mobile applications, right? So if you look at that top level, really what you're looking at is everybody is viewing that damage assessment, because that's what we're talking about is in just a slightly different way, right? Everybody has got a view of that damage in a particular moment in time over the lifespan of that incident. So, you know, you use the best available information that you can and over time, it will start to become clearer and clearer and clearer. Arguably, you know, somebody on the ground, urban search rescue team member on the ground taking a photo at the front door of that house is pretty hard to argue with, right? That's, that's, ground validated, verified impacts. Um, but once again, those change, you know, you go back to something like Maria and it was sequential thunderstorms time after time after time again and a house that looked good after Maria may have been affected by a, a landslide just two weeks later. So, you know, it, it's, it's, it's an ever evolving iterative, iterative process. Well, I, I say all that to say, you know, we see, you know, these building outlines as a key component, and that's the bottom part of my slide here, of providing that foundational data element. So whether, you know, whether or not the information is coming from a model, such as FEMA's HAZUS model, or if it's coming from SISNET or from, you know, a private sector entity, as long as it is relational, as long as we can tie it in, to the rest of it, we can develop a, comp a, a, a comprehensive composite picture of damage. And so one of the ways that we would propose of doing that is through this unique, uh, this universal unique ID. And so putting that out there in a public forum, in a public setting, 
allows other people to tie their view of the world uh, uh, to this through this keystone slash relational uh, approach. All right. I'm going to punch through these real quick because I'm, I'm talking a lot. Um, we, we are very lucky and fortunate to consume data from a number of real-time Internet of Things kind of things. You know, we have a partnership with with a number of, of, of folks, you know, just on this slide, of course, is, is things like Gas Buddy or Waze. Uh, they, they, you know, I don't want to endorse them, but, you know, things like this are, are becoming more and more open and transparent, um, uh, which just really helps, you know, us build dashboards related to, uh, you know, transportation uh, lifeline components. Uh, here's a good example from the, the, the uh, power utility company. So in real time, you're tracking power um, at the county level of, of power outages and those thresholds and what that really means. I'd like to point your attention, please, if I may, to those trend lines. We're, we're seeing a lot of our senior leadership really um, favorably uh, getting excited about trend lines. And, and the more that we start to pull all this real-time information together, the more that you can start to show those cascading effects I spoke of earlier. How do you take seven different disparate uh, lifelines and having things being reported in real time, but then show those interdependencies and those, those, um, those relationships? And so that's what I'm so excited about. I see this as a big growth opportunity for all of us uh, in, able to, in being able to track stability over time. Yes, we are going to get hit with something in the not too distant future. Yes, it's gonna be terrible. And there's going to be a dip, a disturbance in the force. Yes, we will experience significant uh, impacts. The question is, how quick are we? How quick, from a response perspective, are we able to uh, affect a, a dramatic uh, difference in the lives of those survivors, right? Disaster survivors to get them back up to stable. And how do we show that to our decision makers? You need to deploy these types of resources here. You've got a log jam that you may or may not know about. So that's what's so exciting about uh, this technology, artificial intelligence or, or other types of similar platforms of bringing in that real-time information and applying machine learning techniques to identify that signal in the noise. So those are a lot of the things that we're working on. Um, another good example is we, we currently, I sit, one of the things that I do is I support the Situation Awareness Section as part of the National Response Coordination Center. And we are awash in a dearth of information. We have situation reports coming at us from all walks of life. Everybody and their brother wants to tell me about everything. Um, I, I think that's another growth opportunity, especially for artificial intelligence-like technologies, where you're talking about things like natural language generation or natural language processing, where you can take unstructured reports you know, in the masses run it against some of these algorithms, it will parse out and contextualize information and tell you what signal in the noise that you should be paying attention to. So that's some really amazing technology that's coming uh, to bear to light uh, in the not too distant future. So not, it's not just computer vision, it's not just using satellite imagery to do damage assessment. You know, AI has, has a plethora of, of uh, use cases for emergency management, and it's exciting to, uh, to be a part of the, the front hold on this. I think I only have two more slides and I'll get out of here. It's super important uh, to be a part of a community of practice. I commend uh, this team and what you guys are doing now because you're keeping the conversation alive. Thank you for letting me be a part of this conversation. That's the only way we can get through it uh, is to exchange good ideas, exchange what we're doing with each other. Uh, to keep to keep us all fresh and, and, and current on what we're doing. And, and, and as PPD, PPD8 states, this is a whole of community, a whole of nation uh, problem set. Uh, it must include private sector. It must include academia. It must include government and nonprofits working collaboratively to connect on the technology and the skills and the data. And so, you know, uh, you know, that's that's some of the things that we we still need work on is you know, we can't come at it from our own little view of the world. We got to be able to tie our information together. And so uh, that's, that's why I'm excited to be a part of today's conversation. I think, I do think this is my last slide. I would point you all to our community hub page. I think the title of this whole thing for us was, you know, FEMA's new uh, technology platform. Well, I don't know if that's really true. We've, we've had this platform out there 
arguably since around 2012, we did completely revamp it um, for COVID. Uh, COVID really blew the doors off of this for us. I mean, it was, it, it, we were faced with a very daunting challenge of connecting to uh, a very wide uh, uh, community. And I think we rose to that challenge. And, and when I say we, it was a collective team effort here, right? So um, uh, we did stand up a, a, a what's known as a community hub page. We had all 50 states plugged in. We had nonprofit, non, uh, non-governmental, private sector, academia. We had, you know, just uh, thousands and thousands of, of connections, you know, individuals and, and groups and entities, and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of apps related to COVID, uh, tracking everything from not only the case counts and death counts, but PPE resource deployments and where our people were and where we're sending money. So uh, that work continues on. We're, we're obviously right now heavily, heavily engaged in the COVID vaccine effort. I'm sure you guys have seen in any any little inkling of news has got FEMA all over that for the vaccine effort. Yes, we're, we're heavily involved and engaged in that fight. Um, but we took a lot of those same similar constructs and we applied them to uh, natural hazards, uh, everything other than pandemic. So we built out pages obviously related to the lifelines as well as floods, earthquakes, tornadoes, tsunamis, winter weather, those kinds of things. So I'd encourage you to go and check out our website um, uh, if and when you have the time. And if you ever need anything from us, if you have any questions of us, please feel free to reach out uh, at that uh, that site there. Tom, I'll make sure you get this slide deck and you can push it out as far and wide as you need to. And I will stop talking. Awesome, thank you, Chris. So we have a little bit of time for questions here. I know we have one in the Q&A. So Chris, the question is, will these damage assessment tools be utilized for public assistance eligibility assessments? Uh, well, I, I, sh I sure would hope so. I think, you know, I think I, when I first started at FEMA, this is gonna be a long answer to a very simple question. When I first started at FEMA, I, I had kind of a myopic view of damage assessments and I didn't realize that everybody did damage assessments. Everybody does them. You know, Urban Search and Rescue, American Red Cross, uh, we've got like six different teams, you know, the IAPDA team, the PA PDA team, the housing inspector, the PDMG, the, you know, how many people need to go and knock on the same door? You know, so I, I, it's been my dream, it's been my life's passion, my life's work to streamline the damage assessment process. Um, you know, I would argue that, you know, if a house is blown off the face of the earth and you can measure debris volume from that, do you really need to send somebody on the ground 17 times after that to go and assess the same plates over and over again? My argument is no, but guess what? I am one lone voice in a very complex, very systematic, really old system <laughs> that's been around for near 40 years. So uh, there's there's a lot of uh, challenges from a historical context. Um, culturally, it's hard for people to kind of jump over that. I would have, uh, I think they've done some things. I don't want to be dismissive. I think they've done some things that are progressive due to COVID. I think COVID really forced a lot of the conversation of, well, we can't send people in the field anymore. We need to adopt these types of things. So some regions have moved out a little faster than others, but um, um, you know, in their defense, and I'm talking to the non-technologists on the other side of the fence, right? In their defense, we're not quite there yet either. You know, the, the, the technology is still rapidly advancing. We're still working on the algorithms. We're still trying to get all the imagery easily accessible. So while I can see the promised land, it's not quite there yet. It's for sure not to the point where it's a ubiquitous replacement of, of, of the traditional ground base. But I would absolutely argue it is, it is certainly warranted to use this information. If we're involved in it, chances are we're making the data publicly available and open and transparent. Um, but, but work still remains. And in fact, it'll probably last beyond my career, you know, to, to, to really completely shift that needle over. But I, I have a lot of hope. Great, thank you, Chris. Another question. This is from Dave Jones. Can you comment on whether oh, Dave Jones? <laughs> 
Can you comment on whether some of the sensitive data sets from the FEMA hub might be shared with the SICE for information sharing and improved situational awareness? Thanks. Yeah, um, at the moment, at the moment, none of the information that we have on our hub page is sensitive. It's all publicly available. It's none of it is FOUO. Um, I do get that question every now and then, especially from folks like DOD or, you know, they want to slap FOUO on it. Um, and I realize that this video is being recorded, so I should probably shut my face. But usually if somebody gives me an FOUO piece of information, I just say keep it. You know, there's, there's so much information coming at us in a public sense. You know, we know where the power is down. We know where the, you know, you know, if you, it's, it's a tough question. I, I, I know people do get sensitive to some things, but for the most part, almost every, in fact, everything we have on that public facing uh, site is public. There's no FOU on it. So uh, another way of saying that is everything there could be shared with sites. Great. Thank you. Good answer. Um, we have another question. This is from Mitch Erickson, and he asks, a PDA is fundamentally change detection. You stated that you rely on before and after data from sensors like photos and LIDAR, and then algorithms to categorize the extent of damage. Can you skip the before and simply analyze departures from expected structural profiles? That's a great question. Uh, um, I wish there was another way for me to not get techie geeky, but that was a that was a techie geeky question. So I'm going to have to respond techie geeky. So a lot of the algorithms that are coming out now are very sensitive to, um, you know, uh, specific sensors taken in a very specific way in order to do that change detection. Right? It needs to be a one for one match. Um, there is, uh, I think I spoke a little bit about it. There's a challenge out there called XView two. Um, the, the, what's so amazing about XView2 is that you could take any pre-incident image scene, right? You could take it from a satellite or that's the promise is, is a satellite or an aerial platform or whatever, you know, and then compare it to any type of post-incident um, uh, collection platform and, and it matches. So many of the algorithms that are coming out now is you've got to have the right, you know, you've got to have a Sentinel-1 before you've got to have a Sentinel-1 after. Well, this XV2 challenge says, well, you could have a Sentinel-2 compared to a NOAA aerial platform after the end. And, and that's where I think we would all like to have is a, is a uh, non-platform agnostic approach because getting all of those perfect timings aligned, you know, having a perfect before scene with a perfect after scene is kicking our butts, right? It's, 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 it's very difficult to try to pull that off. That's why it's a little easier to do a smaller geography like a tornado but when you get into a large geography like a like a hurricane, like a Hurricane Laura, you just have really egregious, oh, you know, just errors. You know, they're picking up damage assessments in the middle of the ocean. Um, that I know of, we're we're not putting colonies out in the middle of the ocean, but AI is currently picking up damage assessments. In the ocean. Great question. Um, well, once again, I, I I I I would imagine that our goal would be, our dream would be that you could use any sensor before and any sensor after because we. We're just not at the point that um, I can't help myself. I've got to tell this next thing. So he asked, it's my, I can't help myself. The promise though, here's the promise of what's coming, right? So if you look at small sat companies like Capella or ISI or uh, Ursa, um, there's, there's a number of small sat, well, I think just last week, uh, ISI launched like four or five new uh, small sat SAR synthetic capture radar birds up on Elon Musk's uh, SpaceX. Well, if you start saturating space with all of these sensors, the promise is you're going to have the same sensor on the same revisit cycle, like every three hours, right? And so you'll have that before and after. S small SAT, especially small SAT SAR, is likely to completely change emergency management. Here I am, year of our Lord, 2021, January 28th. Chris Vaughn here, hereby says, look, it's, it's really going to change emergency management within the next year or two. There are so many small sat sensors launching right now. It will fundamentally change how quickly we can get a validation of, of estimated impact. And you're going to have a constant re visit repeat cycle uh, that will give you that, uh, that algorithmic uh, confidence level that we need to uh, 
uh, to, to give you that answer. All right, I'll get off that. Great question, thanks. Got me excited, good grief. These are great questions. So we have a couple more minutes. Are there any more questions for Chris? I don't see any more in the Q&A or in the chat. Speak now or forever hold your peace. All well, right. I, I got one for you. I got to get Tom to do me a, a, a marketing pitch, man. That was a great video. Yeah. <laughs> Make the rest of us look bad, buddy. Jeez. That's just hours of talking about the problem, right? It's like, oh, it's hard. We, 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 uh, I was laughing. Uh, we probably spent eight hours putting a two minute video together, but yeah, um, I think because we're fortunate, we have a lot of folks in the utility space, Chris, they, they can crystallize it pretty quick. So, uh, sometimes since the, the longer I'm around, the less people read. So, video seems to be a good forum, and I'm, I'm glad you appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Chris. Very good. So we've got a little bit of a break. Our next session starts at 4.50. So you got seven minutes if you need to take a restroom break or grab a snack. And we'll meet back here if you're staying in track three. If not, um, hop on that link that we've been posting in the chat to go back and click another track. So thank you, everyone. And thanks again, Chris. We'll see you back here at 4.50.